Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of Courage is Calling by Ryan Holiday. Fortune favors the brave. Right, how many Ryan Holiday books have we done now? We've done a lot. This is probably what, our fifth one? Yeah, it, maybe we've done the most holiday books. So it'd be you either him or Godin, yeah. I'd say. Or Green. Green, we've done four. Okay. Well, this is a there new one out of a three-part series that uh, four-part four-part series that Holidays is about to do, and we might be chatting to him as well. So That's stay right. tuned. Stay tuned. Well, he says this, there's nothing we prize more than courage, like nothing that we want more, nothing we respect more. But there's also nothing in shorter supply. A lot of people want to be courageous; they admire courageousness, but at the same time, aren't courageous. Courage. It's not a finite resource that is doled out randomly and only accessible to some elite few in society it's something quite simple really it's it's renewable it's there in each of us everywhere all around the world and it's something that we're capable of in a moment's notice it matters a big and small whether it be physical or moral but it does remain so rare because we're afraid because often it's easier not to get involved than to speak up or to step in or because we have something else we're working on maybe now's not a good time often we'd rather just stick to what's safe uh, it's kind of understandable logic to to shirk courage, but if everyone thought that way, then there's not really a lot left. Oh, there wouldn't be much going on all throughout history. Nothing really cool probably would have ever happened because all of the greatest moments in human history, they pretty much all share the one thing, and that's whether it's the landing on the moon, progressive civil rights, the final stand at... I haven't heard of this one, to be honest, the Thermopylae. <laughs> Have you heard of that one? Yeah. What's that? Um, Pressfield talks about it a fair bit as well. What is it? Isn't that the, isn't that the Spartans? <laughs> well, you don't know either. Thermopylae. Do Thermopylae. Yeah, that was, a, that was a big Spartans. Okay, the Spartans. Big King, King Leon, Leonidas, <laughs> the first. Jesus. I don't know why Holiday thinks we know about that. But we do know about the re- Renaissance. But any, at the end of the day, all the cool stuff was all about the bravery of ordinary people. You and me, we're all ordinary, but if we are able to take on this bravery, then we could probably do the same sort of extraordinary things or be really the catalyst behind some of these things. We kind of think that there are two different definitions of courage. There's like physical courage. That's like the knight riding into battle, the firefighter rushing into the burning building to save the crying child, the explorer setting out to sea, not knowing what they'll find on the other side. Then there's kind of the moral courage. That's like the whistleblower taking on powerful interests, the truth teller who says what no one else will say, the entrepreneur going into business for themselves against all odds. But really, those two seemingly different forms of courage, the physical and the moral, they really are just the same thing. They aren't two different kinds of courage. They're just one. It's just courage. And courage is really just when you're putting your ass on the line. Some cases, literally. Some cases, figuratively. Yes, it's putting your ass on the line and it's all about risk. And We've got these moments where we could be stepping up to the plate and putting our body on behind the ball. And this is when courage is calling us all very differently in different times, in different forms, throughout our days, throughout our months, and, and our, ultimately our, our lives as well. And whatever call you're hearing right now, what matters is that how you answer from here. What matters is that you go to do it. And in this ugly world, courage is what allows beautiful things to happen. So what prevents courage? What makes this thing that's so prized but so rare? You know, what keeps us from doing what we kind of know or feel that we should be doing? What's this source of cowardice? Fear. Fear. <laughs> fear. I don't know what about. Fear. It just brought me back to uh, old Robbins. That's how he says, fear. Fear. But it's So when it comes to fear, it's impossible to beat an enemy we don't understand. So we need to pull out the, the fear rule book and begin to understand it. And in all its forms, from terror to apathy to hatred to wanting you to play small, because this is the enemy of courage and, and the difference between you and taking on that bravery. He says that the Spartans built temples to fear. I reckon that was before their Battle of Thermopylae as well, that final stand. Those 300 Spartans that took down the, uh, I don't know who they took down. <laughs> don't know the story, like I know. I'm calling you out here. You know, they built temples to fear. Uh, they they want to keep fear close. They want to see how powerful fear was, but they also want to ward it off because it's not that the brave are without fear. No one is without fear, but rather it's those who have the ability to rise above the fear, to master the fear. They're the people that become so remarkable. So if we want to be these remarkable people and be great, we must first learn how to conquer this fear or at least rise above it in those critical moments that really matter. 
So when the world calls on to you and knocks on your door to do something great, the call we're hearing is fear. This is the voice inside our heads that turns us as people into the direction of what we're about to become. And it's up to us whether or not to follow these voices inside our head. All of us are going to get a call at some point, whether it's a call to service, a call to take a risk, a call to challenge the status quo, a call to run towards while everyone else is running away, a call to do what other people say is impossible. And there are going to be plenty of reasons why we feel that this call is absurd, why we feel that this is maybe not the right thing to do. We're going to find plenty of justifications not to do it. There's going to be plenty of fear. The fear is really going to make itself felt. It always does. So it's really going to be up to us to decide which are we going to listen to. Are we going to listen to the fear or are we going to listen to that calling and do what is probably less comfortable, less easy, but probably the right thing to do in the end? William Faulkner, he distinguished between two things. Right? He said, be scared. You can't help that, but never be afraid. Because a scare, this is something that we're all going to have. It's like this little temporary rush or a feeling sort of can be forgiven. We're all going to have that. But fear and being afraid is a state of being. And if you allow this to rule your state of being, it can turn into a disgrace. So one helps you. It sort of makes you a bit more alert, wakes you up, informs you of the danger. Now, the other one, that's going to knock you out. It's going to drag you down and weaken you and even paralyze you from doing nothing. That's right. It's okay to be scared because everyone's going to be scared, but it's not okay to let that stop you. The receiver, they can't catch the football if they're going to flinch in anticipation of the hit. The artist, they can't deliver the performance if they're trembling uh, when they know that those those critics are ready to unleash on them. Again, like uh, you know, Pressfield's critics really unleashed on him. If you let that scare stop you, then you're letting fear win. The only way through these feelings and this call of fear is to attack it logically, clearly, empathetically. And now the part of the brain that sees the worst and it extrapolates the craziest scenario of all everything just turning into shit and it completely underestimates your ability on how to handle these things, this little voice, it's not your friend and it's also not the truth and it's certainly not going to turn you into a brave person. Yeah, instead of catastrophizing, instead of letting that little voice in the back of your head overpower you, just remind yourself, whatever it is, you know, oh, it's just money or it's just one bad article or it's just a meeting with people yelling at each other. Because they're really things that you don't really need to be afraid of. If you break it down and if you investigate, if you really look at the facts, then this thing that you're really, really fearing, it's probably not that scary at all. Like, yeah, it's going to be a little bit scary, but it's nothing to be afraid of. Yeah, certainly not. One of Astro's favorite people throughout history, uh, Demosthenes, he woke up one day to find <laughs> he woke up one day to find that he was about to be attacked by both sea and land pretty scary for him it was overwhelming him and his men and his soldiers all felt it so he did the only thing that there was to do he got busy trying to defend himself from the attack and marching his men down from the water he knew they were in for a well and hell of a day so he had to pull out a pretty nice pep talk and this is exactly what he did he said soldiers and comrades in this adventure i don't know what voice <laughs> accent we're going with I hope that none of you in our present straits will think to show his wit by exactly calculating all the perils that encompass us, but that you will rather hasten to close with the enemy without staying to count the odds, seeing in this your best chance of safety. In emergencies like ours, calculation is out of place. The sooner the danger I face, the better. There you go. That's it. If You can, you can sit back. You can think about uh, logically about all these things that are in front of you or... Probably in, in a lot of cases, sometimes the best thing is just to get started. Get yeah, get action. straight into it. I mean, my partner's sister is currently super, super pregnant, about to pop, but very similar to our old general here. She's saying she wants to get it over and done with as soon as she possibly can. <laughs> um, she'd rather a long labor that happens straight away rather than have to wait for a longer time for a shorter labor. <laughs> it's okay. pretty ironic, but that's probably, you know, in dealing with the fear, it's sort of just like, just get it done. Just get it out of your head and get it done and out of the way. And then that's one way of getting rid of it. There you go. Uh, and then another story as well, the old Canadian astronaut, Chris Hadfield, he went on his first spacewalk. And just as soon as he popped out into space, his left eye went blind. And then uh, not long after that, his right eye started to tear up. And then those tears froze, which meant his right eye was blind as well. So you're out in the middle of space. High stakes. Floating around, can't see anything. <laughs> You'd there's, be worried. There's movies about that where people just float off. I mean, you actually, we'd say that's it. You just jump out, <laughs> jump away into space. So he's literally in complete darkness, teetering on the edge of the abyss. 
uh, of even more darkness, which is just game over for poor Chris. But he said later that he just, in the situation like this, he just had to remind himself. He said, look, there are at least six things that I can do right now and all of these are going to make things better. Obviously, if he panicked, that's going to make things a hell of a lot worse. But he knows that there's just like six small things that he could do to make this situation better. And he says that there's no problem so bad that you can't make it worse. So, he just thought, okay, what can I do right now? What's right in front of me? What's the simple thing that I can do? Stop worrying, stop fearing, stop being afraid and just think, okay, what can I do right now to make this situation better? That's it. And that's approaching fear logically and pathetically like our man Holiday is being claimed the way we should do it because we're all here for such a brief time. We don't want to be controlled by this emotion where we don't get to do anything cool in our lifetime. We need to get over this thing. So how do we want to spend our time on earth? Like we, Most of us probably don't want to be a coward, but I think that's probably the status quo is just to be in a bit of a coward and letting the driving force in life, fear just turning you into places you probably don't want to end up. And this is what's going to happen if we don't do something about it and don't act on it. As one of your great idols, Florence Nightingale said, she would rather die 10 times in the surf trying to find a new world than to stand idly on the shore. And it's going to be bloody scary if you're going to try and push off into the surf, trying to do something courageous, trying to find something new. It's going to be pretty easy to stay on the shore, but that's the fear holding you back. Instead, you need to be one of those very few, those rare people that put yourself in a position to take the leap. There's a few ways we can deal with the fear logically. This is how we can make the steps to becoming more courageous. One thing we can all do is prepare and preparation often makes us brave. Training, something that athletes do, they do it when the stakes are low, they do it during the week because they know when the big battle comes on the weekend, when it's game time, they know there's going to be a hell of a lot going on and if they've trained it, if they've practiced it, they're not going to be as scared when that big 120 kilo guy is pounding down on you and about to slam you into the turf, then they won't be, they'll be a bit scared but not as scared if they didn't train. You'd be pretty scared without the training, <laughs> wouldn't you? Like our mate who was in space, Chris, right? He had six things he could do straight away. That was because in his brain, he prepared his muscle memory to for all sorts of circumstances that might pop up. Think about me and you, the first time we were on TV promoting our book on Channel 10 was the first one. We were absolutely shitting ourselves like a week before, but it's through this, this fear, it can really drive you to over-prepare. I think we spent... Uh, say we're on TV for about seven minutes, with at least an hour per minute. Yeah. And through that preparation, <laughs> yeah. I think my voice broke in one of the first sentences, which didn't help. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the preparation <laughs> got rid of a lot of the fear to make it easier. Yeah, that's right. Training, it's not just for the athletes. It's not just for soldiers who practice. Everyone should be able to practice. And as uh, Big Epictetus, so the book we did, Enchiridion, uh, last season, he says that the... Your goal really is whenever adversity pops up, whenever a, a scary situation pops up, for you to be able to say, this is what I've trained for. This is, this is what I've used my discipline for. This is, you know, you've built your muscle memory so that you, you know what's coming for you. You've gone through all the drills. You've played your scales. You've practiced every possible uh, situation that could hit you so that you know when the time comes that you know exactly what to do. So preparation is important. But beyond that, just starting. Just starting and doing something and taking some sort of action, it's something that's going to remove the, the obstacles of fear. The French, they speak of petite actions, uh, those first small steps, the builders of momentum, and the little things that add up. So in this perspective, you don't need to lead a huge change, but by focusing on something small, it's less intimidating. Thomas Edison kind of disagreed. He was like, well, yeah, you Frenchies, you can have your old, uh, you know, start small. But Thomas Edison, he was saying, no, I want to start on something big. I want to be, you know, tackle the hard, ambitious projects. I want to be making a light bulb for the first time ever. I want to be making a fuel storage cells. He says he didn't want to do something small. He wanted to do something big. So how can we kind of align both of these, you know, this we want to do something big, but we also need to start somewhere small. Well, you can do both. You can, you can do both, yeah. You can begin with the petites actions, but on our magnum opus at the same time. So start small on something big. Oh, there you go. I All like right, it. so you're getting the best of both worlds there. Yeah, I like it. As uh, we'll bring Florence back in, she was uh, effectively founded the American Red Cross, changed the world of nursing forever. But she didn't just set out and say, "Okay, I'm going to create the Red Cross. I'm going to change the whole world of nursing." Really, she just started small on that big thing. She just started working in a hospital for one summer, and that's really what gave her the courage and the confidence to start building that up over time until she eventually got to that big thing. 
I'm sure Thomas Edison as well. He reckons, you know, he wanted to start on the big things. I'm sure he started small with the light bulb. He no, he just, did. He wouldn't have just gone straight to light bulb level. No, nah, he would have. He would have. Uh, well, he had those thousand experiments. Yeah, that's right. I'm sure there they were go. little experiments. So when we become courageous, the best part about it, you could say, is it's contagious. When another country called on our friends in Sparta for military help, the Spartans wouldn't send their army. They would send just one Spartan commander. That's pretty insane, isn't it? It's a good it? story. That's it a good cool story. Because that one person just walking out towards the battlefield, people behind that be like, shit. Look at, <laughs> look at Johnny over there. I don't know what names were. John's been a perennial name. So once he starts walking out, the majority began to follow because that leadership is really what inspired the courage in everyone else. Yeah, that courage was really contagious. And they, they said that there's like a, an old saying, uh, one person with courage makes a majority. Obviously, that person isn't the majority to begin with, but the word, the key word there is makes, as in that one person makes a majority. They, with that one Spartan with that enormous amount of courage just plow on ahead to the battlefield against the opposing army. Probably no one's following him at first, but they realize, okay, there's a bit of courage. Eventually, that becomes the majority. Then, then the entire army feels courageous. You can see this clearly in sports, I think. So whatever your football code is, it's a contact sport. If one person does a really courageous act on the field, so say in the footy field, they do something crazy, it's a noticeable difference what happens to the team and how contagious it is to everyone around that person. Um, they're all going to be playing in that same level of courage. Also, it goes the other way. If someone <laughs> balks and just dodges the ball or something, you see whole entire teams implode from a few mm-hmm. early actions that become contagious about people turning into cowards. I've got a poem for you, Jonesy. This is by the great Henry w- Wadsworth Longfellow. That's a that's a poet's name if ever it's you've seen it. It's a good name, one. isn't it? Longfellow. And and words. <laughs> words Where, with long, Longfellow. It's a great name. <laughs> If, you, if you're a poet, you'd want to be called Henry Words with Longfellow. And he says, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not much of a poet myself, but let's see how we go. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like the dumb driven cattle, be a hero in the strife. Okay, I like it. <laughs> so if courage, like we've been saying, is the act of just putting your body behind the ball, putting your ass on the line, the definition of the heroic it's very simple. It's risking yourself, but for somebody else. Mm. Like our man, the long, the guy with the long fellow. Be a hero <laughs> in, be a hero in the strife. That's right. Don't be that dumb, driven cattle. You, <laughs> you, <laughs> you want to be putting yourself on the line. So courage is putting your ass on the line, putting your body behind the ball. But then heroism is the next level up. That's when you're taking the risk, not just for your own benefit, for the benefit of someone else. Uh, something else, some larger cause, bigger than yourself. And when we're doing this, the hero it enters a higher plane. I've got a story here demonstrating this. In 1969, in the Vietnam War, Captain James Stockdale, who was 46 years old and a prisoner of war, he was getting smacked up by the prison guards, as you do in prison camps. The brutal beatings and deprivations, they've been pretty hard for him. He was struggling. He was scared. And the guards, they wanted him to look as presentable as possible for the cameras. They wanted him to shave and, and just sit in front of the cameras and just say, hey, we're doing pretty well in yeah. these camps <laughs> yeah. and just lie out of his ass. They wanted to use him as a bit of a propaganda, a bit of just, you know, look, we've got your prisoners, but we're treating them all right. Instead, Stockdale, he was like, nah, I'm going to, here's an opportunity here to show a bit of courage, to show a bit of heroism. He took the razor blade that they'd given him to shave and he slashed open a big three-inch gash across his forehead. But then he kind of thought, ah, oh, that's not enough. I need to do a bit more than that. He grabbed a wooden stool and bashed his face repeatedly, just smashing, smashing, smashing the stool into, this, into his face until his eyes and face had swollen up so much that he couldn't even see anymore. And that was kind of the beginning of the end of this Hanoi Hilton, this awful prisoners of war camp. He kind of started to turn the tide here. Yeah, he wasn't a doing for himself, obviously. He'd be net more pain <laughs> going through that process <laughs> than he would have otherwise. So he was doing it for his people, his men, and also for his country. Yeah, the, the torture slightly sort of got a bit worse after that. So Stockdale says, okay, well, I didn't go hard enough last time. I'm going to go a bit harder this time. What he did then was when he was tied up to a chair one time, he waddled over to a window, smashed the window. He took a, a pane of glass, slashed it across his wrists, 
And he says, look, the last thing the North Vietnamese wanted was me dead because they, they needed... A public figure at one stage. They needed big Stockdale as like, look, we're treating them fine. So they didn't want him dead. So they were looking after him. They were looking after him. They tried to bring him back to life. He didn't know if this attempted suicide was, was going to work or not work. He, he was basically on the brink. He was out of it for, for days. But eventually, he sort of came back around and eventually... They're kind of like, okay, maybe we've gone a bit too hard on these. Maybe we've gone a bit too hard on these prisoners. We better lighten up a bit. Yeah. Another one comes to mind, I think, here. Really, one of the most famous images of history was a Vietnamese monk, Thich Quang Doc. Um, and he was deeply distressed by the South Vietnamese at the time, persecuting the Buddhist citizens. And he decided he would make one wild gesture of, of defiance. And remember in that. I don't know what's square, but it's this this monk. He just lights himself on fire, mm. and he's just so calm during it. It's insane, isn't? It? I haven't actually seen the full thing. It's a pretty sick thing to watch, but <laughs> to think yourself on fire and you're not moving like that, the whole world's going to look at that. And you know, what the hell is happening here? Yeah, it's a anyone who sees that image can't unsee that image. You see a person sitting there in complete stillness and complete calmness, but engulfed in massive flames of fire, doused himself in. In, in petrol, lit himself a light and literally just sat there until his whole body disintegrated. Now, he was definitely not doing that for himself. No, <laughs> no. That was certainly for something bigger than himself. I think these are pretty extreme examples. <laughs> it has to come with a caveat. That it probably don't go to these extremities if you really believe in something. You you it'd have to be a pretty big cause, I reckon. And you yeah. want to hope shit changes afterwards, wouldn't you? Yeah. Like these two, it was a bit of a narrative fallacy here because things <laughs> did change because of them. Yeah. We probably don't hear about the ones who go, I'm going to take a punt on this one sacrifice my life for this and then hey nothing really changes it's not a bit of depressing a lot of people often ask when they're confronted or they're called for a big challenge they say well what's in it for me but the flip side of this is the courage to rise above whatever our personal limits are to strive for something bigger in service of others so we've had a couple of stories of physical acts of courage Um, there's another one here in 1961 John Lewis he was knocked unconscious by a man for trying to use a whites only waiting room at a bus stop in South Carolina. Now, it's one of many senseless beatings that Lewis received in his courageous campaign as a freedom writer and a civil rights activist. He'd been copping it all the time, like the whole entire black community back then. You'd think that uh, any of these senseless beatings would have been enough. You know, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, the one that finally broke his heart and broke his spirit, and he said, okay, well, I better just step back into line. I better put my head down. I better not use the, the whites-only waiting room. But... All he was asking for really was the most minimal of human decency. He just wanted to, you know, take a seat, to put his feet up, to have a bit of a rest. But there were just people who wanted to kill him over that minimal human decency that he was asking for. And in fact, many of his friends and so many innocent children at that time actually were killed for daring to insist on these simple rights. Most would have given up after their first or fourth or fourteenth beating. But John Lewis, he was arrested and taken to jail and beaten up forty-five times. So he wasn't going to stop on this one. And 48 years later, this super courageous man, Lewis, he had the chance to meet his attackers and one of them was Alwyn Wilson. They met face to face because Wilson was ready to apologize. And more surprisingly, Lewis, after all this, he was still willing to accept it. It's kind of uh, just about the craziest and bravest thing that you can do is to keep hoping. You keep getting bashed up. You keep getting arrested and taken to jail for these simple things, but you keep hoping that eventually the tide's going to turn and eventually things are going to change. It's crazy, but it's also extremely brave. Leaders, they're dealers in hope. Nobody wants to live in a world without a tomorrow or a big great reason to continue with some sort of dot on the horizon that you need to be aiming at. And if we want that, we're going to have to make it happen for the other people that we're trying to do it for and for ourselves in a heroic manner. And whatever we do, we cannot surrender to the bitterness that might just be tapping us on the shoulder. Mm-hmm.